podcasting from Chico, California, tucked in between some of Northern California's best freshwater fisheries. This is the Barbless Podcast, a podcast about NorCal fly fishing, guiding, fisheries management, and sustainability. If you have ideas or any questions for the show, leave the guys a voice message on the Barbless Podcast hotline, area code 530-636-2523. Also check out http colon slash slash podcast.barbless.co, where you can download past episodes and show notes. Be sure to follow them on Instagram at barbless.co and connect with them on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash barbless.co. Here's your hosts, Chad Alderson and Nick Hanna. Fish on. Welcome to another episode of the Barbless Fly Fishing Podcast. Uh, co-host, Chad Alderson. You probably know Nick Hanna. Nick, what's up? Hey, how we doing, man? You been fishing lately? Uh, guiding a little bit. Yeah, I've been sick. I saw that you posted some nice uh, fish. Caught, uh, yeah, there's all kinds of things. Steelhead, trout, striper, you name it. It's kind of going on. Were you, what, can you it's talk salmon, about? right? We got to, not yet, not quite. Not yet. But people yeah. are catching them on accident, which is, you know. Yeah. So it's a well, good sign that we had a lot of water this year and it's going to be, uh, I think it's going to be epic fishing. Yeah. Well, today's uh, topic is uh, tools of the trade in terms of what a fish biologist uses to do their job. Um, there's a, a variety of different uh, tools that they have in their quiver. And with us today is Tyler Pilger and Michael Hellmeyer from Fish Bio. Welcome back, guys. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks. Yeah. Good to be here again. Thanks for having us. Yeah. So why why do we need to understand like what why do you even need these tools in your in your tool chest to even do the, your jobs well so for for our jobs i think the the basic questions often come down to which fish and how many of them are where at what time and if we could answer those questions well, we'd probably be out of a job because it's not it's not that easy. <laughs> so it's like taking an accurate census if I if I'm a census taker in the government. Pretty Correct. much, if you're right. a and, or a and I'm going to do like city planning or something. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And there's a you know a handful of tools that or a handful of methods that that come into play fairly frequently, including some actual tools um, that there seems to be quite a bit of of public misconceptions about including electro fishing including trapping um so we'll we'll try to talk about those yeah in a has that evolved detail. a lot over time like in the last 50 years oh yeah it has oh yeah 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 so i, mean, I, I was just thinking about technology and what you guys have available now i mean it must have been just a pain when you talk about trying to yeah, know that, what right. fish is Maybe. where so why, like, don't, why don't you guys talk about what you guys used to have snorkel. like your your so, your forefathers used to deal with and then like you know fast forward to today that's a really good this, angle the very early electro fishing units were nothing more than like the crank phones and you just jump the wires into yeah. the water um, and that would produce enough electric current to shock the fish. <laughs> and, and were they, um, were they chained to like a, uh, like a mattress, like on Rambo? No, no, no. no just I guess, do it off I guess of a it's Rambo or do it on a part boat, two. you know? Um, but we have a lot more sophisticated, uh, equipment these days. Okay. But, of- but the, the end goal has always been the same, right? But it's just these tools and methods have kind of evolved because of technology. Yeah, some of them, some of them have evolved. Some of them have stayed pretty much the same. Yeah, you know, for I mean, people it's have science. been using nets for thousands right. of years, right. and we're still we're still using mm. nets because they work. Yeah, right, and they're you know non invasive fish don't necessarily get hurt if you depending on what type of net you use. Um, same nets. Um, in that particular case, you, you know, you scoop them up and you can count them and measure them, get your hands on them and let them go unharmed. Um, if you're talking about fish removal, gill nets <laughs> right. are frequently used. Is um, that for invasive species mostly or for invasive species or, or some other for to sample place or fit to sample fish in places where otherwise you can't really get to deep down in a reservoir, for okay, example, how okay. do you figure out, you know, what there is and, and how many there are, you just have to try to standardize a, a gill netting approach, but once a fish is caught in a gill net, um, They're done. they usually don't swim away happily after that, yes. Right. When I was um, an undergrad, um, I got to help out on some walleye spawning um, activities at one of the reservoirs. Um, and so we, they, um, the, the hatchery people would go and put out the gill nets the night before, and we'd show up 
super early, the butt crack of dawn, <laughs> um, to get out there on the boats. And um, we were pulling these walleyes, males and females, out of the gill nets, and they were still kicking because um, we did, you know, they were only in there overnight. And from there, once we got them onto the boat, then we did the normal hatchery related stuff. So that was one way in which she used that tool to basically collect the fish they the hatchery needed in order to spawn mm-hmm. the next generation are of walleye. Are free spawners? Are they do they I can't uh, I don't know. I've never I think brought, so, yeah. brush. Brush. Is it, okay. Um trees, twigs. Okay. So I think a lot of times what they do and, and this might be more applicable to like the European walleye counterpart, uh, Xander. Uh-huh. I know when I was working over there, a lot of the restoration activity um, involved basically cementing old Christmas trees to like a, a little concrete block, right. and sinking them in the lake. Right, um, right. And they would they would use that for for spawning. Sorry, mm-hmm. I got off subject there. That's all right. <laughs> Not the first time we'll be the last. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So what? Uh, so what other tools do you guys use? Um, well, we could talk about electrofishing a little bit since when I talk to, to non-biologist friends of mine and, and, and lots of fishermen for that matter, um, the electrofishing seems to be sort of this, this magic tool that biologists have where you can just, you know, stick an anode in the water and flip a switch and every fish in the water will just go belly up and you can scoop them up and count them and measure them and, and all those things. And it's not really, that's not really how it works, um, You are putting electricity in the water, and there's various ways of doing that. Um, The most frequently used these days are probably the the backpack units, and they're actually battery-operated. Back in the day, you used to carry around a generator on your back, a (laughs) two-stroke. It smelled really nice and made you (laughs) feel woozy by the end of the day. Loud, (laughs) very loud. Looked like a Ghostbusters power pack. Absolutely. (laughs) They still look like that, but at least they're not as loud anymore. Um, And then there's... Two electrodes that enter the water. So you have a, a anode that's usually on your pole with a, a ring at the end, and a cathode that's kind of a rat a, a rat tail wire that you drag behind you. Mm-hmm. And when the unit's switched on, electricity flows from f- between the electrodes. And when if there's a an electric field surrounding, you can kind of envision it as a if you want to picture a, a butterfly, you kind of have that, you know, the centerpiece, the body of the butterfly, and then the wings, you kind of have these concentric circles radiating out from top to the bottom, mm-hmm. almost like a, a it's magnetic like a ripple. field. Kind of like yeah. a ripple on the, like a lake, exactly. but it only goes out a certain distance. Exactly. <laughs> and the closer you are to the electrodes, the stronger the field is. And the closer together the, like, lines of equal current are. Um. And the spacing of those lines, the, those electric lines, is pretty much what what it, um, affects the efficiency of an electrofisher. So if you're mm. if you're a really small fish, and your body doesn't span, you know, the lines from like high power to low power, the fish doesn't really feel anything. If you have a really large fish, the the gradient, mm. the electric gradient that that fish spans is much, much larger. So large hmm. fish are affected much more strongly. Hmm. Um, but then again, larger fish are much more difficult to get close to without spooking them first. Yeah, it's counterintuitive how that works because you think the younger ones would be the most susceptible because they're not as like hardy or whatever. Yeah, know? no, they're they're easier to approach yeah. and easier to surprise yeah. um, with the electro fisher, but, but they're not affected by the electricity as much. And when a fish is caught, Within that field, um, the the electric current basically causes them. It's it's electrotaxis or galvanotaxis, which is like a forced swimming. So their muscles basically contract. They're forced to swim towards the electric poles, the electric anodes. And in theory, and and ideally, you'd see that forced swimming. You'd see that fish swimming up, and you scoop them up right away. Um, you do that before they they lose conscience or you know become become immobilized you don't want to stun them or you don't want to have them pass out you just want to basically force force them to swim to where you can see them net them and then scoop them get them out of that field as quickly mm-hmm. as you can hmm. and there's different settings um so you mess around with 
um, the frequency of those those fields or the pulses. Um, you mess around with the voltage that you're entering into the water and all of these things. Um, then this is getting a little bit more advanced, uh, you know, study on um, electrofishing. But uh, we know now that um, you know you can adjust the settings and to kind of ta- tailor your 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 electrofishing to the specific water that you're in. Um, because you have to account for the conductivity of the water mm-hmm. and all these other things. So, um, and, and the specific species you're mm-hmm. looking at and some species, uh, that, you know, have large uh, swim bladders or the ones that will definitely flip up and float to the top. And then you have other species that just kind of roll along the bottom. Uh, oh, cat, wow. fi- catfish are one that are hard to electrofish because they don't they just, pop up to the surface. They just tend to roll. So what do you do? Like just make sure the depth of the water is like knee deep and put a net all the way on the bottom and just wait for them to roll up. Um, if you can, otherwise we've had instances where you'll have a, um, electro fishing raft go through first and then a follow, follow up raft to scoop up the fish Wait, that only right. come up later. Right. Okay. Huh. Well, okay. So, um, in terms so do you guys, you ju- guys like adjust the polar, the polarity based on the size of the fish then it sounds like, is that how it works basically? Or is it species specific? Um, these days. A lot of the the calibration of the initial settings is is pretty much automated. Okay. Because it, mm-hmm. it, you know it gives you get a, a conductivity reading of the water. Okay. The mm-hmm. more dissolved um, minerals and salts, whatever is in the water, the higher the conductivity. That makes and sense. You kind of want to you know change your your current and your your huh. your amperage and your voltage um, accordingly. But that's basically the the conductivity of the water is basically is the main ingredient into the whole electro fishing recipe, if you will, because it works because fresh water has a lower conductivity than the salt concentration in the fish. So it's easier for electricity to flow through the fish than to flow through the water. And it seeks to pass the least resistance, if you will. Right. You put it in the water and it finds a fish that has, you know, internal salt concentration that's higher than the surrounding water. Yeah, it passes through the fish and and causes that that forced swimming. So th- this is a two parter. Um, one, have any of you been shocked on accident in, in the water? And two, can you feel it? <laughs> yes, many times. Yes. Yeah. Many times. How how bad does feel, it hurt? So I was just thinking. I want to sit. I want to feel it. Um, Let's see what happens. You know, it's it stings. It's more of a stinging sensation. So usually with the is it like lac- a shock collar. Like you ever been I've tested a shot collar on for never a dog? Actually, put the shot. <laughs> what about a what about a nine <laughs> volt nine volt battery on your tongue? Oh, it's ba- it's a little bit worse than that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's it it doesn't feel good. Yeah, it really okay. Doesn't. Huh. Um, no, it's, your legs, the muscles in your legs start shaking, and you yeah, know, they're like, oh, so okay, that that leg's moving there, like it shouldn't, and then it just, I, I mean, it just it just stings really, like all mm. over, like if. And this mostly happens if you get wet in your waders. I was going to say your waders right. on, just any kind of ground. Basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then what's the mortality rate on say if if you're going to shock a thousand fish, how many how many die? That's pretty difficult to answer just because it's if so nothing's dependent botched. On depends on if Mike's so doing it or yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, definitely <laughs> crew dependent. If it's crew, crew but dependent. let's say you have your A team and they everything's dialed, all things being equal, what's the percentage? Less than a percent. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. That's for, that's very good then. Yeah. No, so if, a bad yeah. day would be twenty percent maybe. We yeah, uh, if we ever got close to that, we go yeah. home much much earlier yeah. that yeah. day. And what's a, a typical sample size you're shooting for? Um, I'm trying to think a few years back when we had a, a large project on the Sacramento that involved electro fishing and that, um, aimed at figuring out which, which habitat is most frequently used or which habitat features are most frequently used by juvenile salmonids. Um, that was a, a three year project, a three year active field project where we sampled all said and done, probably about 8,500 different point specific points and captures in the vicinity. locations 8500 different locations different locations Holy different shoreline smoke. points that's and, a ton and captured somewhere close to 5000 fish okay is that using wow. that pack or was it using the, that was this, using a boat the boat right mm-hmm. yeah God, which dang, is a different that's... system kind of but yeah it's, same it's concept. larger much larger mm-hmm. big generator so not not battery operated anymore but a big generator yeah um i mean studies um that 
we tend to do, we, um, especially with mark recapture studies, that's where we um, try to collect as many fish as we can, sample as many, get our hands on as many individuals as possible, um, mark them, put them back in the water. I mean, we're looking for, you know, thousands of thousands of fish mm-hmm. to, to do that with in order to get any sort of um, statistical rigor in our estimates, really. Did you guys kind of know where they were at and just go right to them and, and start finding them? Or was it, did it take a little, did you learn, I guess, what, what did you learn? What well, it, it depends on some projects like that Sacramento project. It was kind of predetermined, right? Yeah. We had a, a few stretches of shoreline that we wanted to compare. Yeah. And even though after a few attempts, it was fairly obvious that there's fewer fish to be found in some areas than in others. We still had to, you know, go back and re resample. Right. Um, for projects where the intention is to collect as many fish as effectively as possible, um, either to, you know, collect genetic samples or scale samples or, or tag the fish. Um, and then again, the intention, if you tag a fish is to release it unharmed, right? So mm-hmm. you want to be as, as easy as you can be on these fish and that, but still, still capture them. Um, but uh, for, for projects like that, you can kind of hone in on those places where you suspect fish. When, um, when you guys were doing these shocking and you were doing small, right? Basically you're tr- tr- counting small. Is that right? For the, on the Sacramento, you mean? Yeah. Yes. So and that was, d- did you inadvertently, uh, get any predators? And if so, what type? Lots and lots of smallmouth bass, um, usually fairly small fish, you know, six to eight inches or so. Um, that was by far the most abundant predator. Hmm. Um, smallmouth, huh? Yes. Yeah, that's. I, I, was, I thought he was going to say striper. No, right? we got There's a we, lot of smallmouth in that river. Huh. There is a lot of smallmouth yeah. in that river. And so like any, just kind of like the softer eddies and stuff like that is where they were? Yeah, usually associated with with any type of wood. It was kind of interesting. The the salmon hmm. seemed to be more associated with submerged vegetation, so grass, mm-hmm. you know, bushes, that type of stuff, and any type of dead wood um, was usually smallmouth habitat. Much okay, more so interesting and and hard bottom, always hard bottom for smallmouth. Any so, type of rip rap, big okay, rocks. That's okay. usually where the smallmouth were. Just um, for the cover. For the cover, yeah, and yeah. the the soft substrate, any you know mud, silt, um, that's usually where the salmon were hanging out. Okay, so huh. Well, um, do you have any other questions on that one before we move? Okay, we did get stripers um, too. A few, ones, but a but few. but that, that, way again, more that, bass. That, sounds that, like that's that's one of the difficult things about about the electro fishing. Right? You have a thirty pound striper, and It'll if you resist. try to if you try to get close to that fish with a boat. Chances are that fish will bolt long, uh, long right. before you can t- flip flip the power switch and stun that fish. Or, or so have that just fish because affected. they're they're not coming up on the on their bellies doesn't necessarily mean they're not present. No. Nope. Mm-hmm. Okay, that makes sense. What other tools? Um, well, we can talk about some of the the fancier tools. Um, I know we talked about eDNA mm-hmm. before on the show, but that's definitely something that's up and coming. You know, as a very non-invasive method where you basically filter water and, and capture the genetic material of well everything that's in the water and then you look for you look for the particular pieces that fit to a particular species to, mm-hmm. to figure out if they're present or absent and um, is it safe to say that for every species that you're that is in your id database it's that genome's been sequenced ahead of time no, no, no. There's still a lot of fish species whose genomes have not been so completely sequenced. Are those just question marks then? No, because how do they know? Um, you can you can look at a, a DNA sequence of one species, um, and if there's another species that's closely related to it that has had its genome sequenced or at least parts of its genome sequenced, mm-hmm. you can narrow it down through process. Yeah, you can look at similarities. So okay. species that are more closely related are going to um, have more similar DNA than species that are okay. very different. So yeah, you're not, you don't necessarily need the, the whole genome sequenced for, you know, all fish species in your area, but you need to have identifying pieces. So specific mm-hmm. pieces. So you need a, you know, a striped bass cookie cutter, that you can look, see if it fits in your sample somewhere, and you need a pike minnow cookie cutter to see if it fits your sample somewhere, mm-hmm. um, et cetera. And I think those those different cookie cutters, if you want to call it that, um, those are available for 
pretty much all and fish yeah. in the in so Sacramento San Joaquin just Basin. like walk through kind of like the the tactical piece of of it you just like put a vial in the water and take that <laughs> you ship that off some to a lab and they tell you or how does that work um so it works it works by filtering water so you want to filter a certain volume of water because the dna is suspended in the water column okay. and you pull that over a filter and that filter is um it's a very specific filter that DNA in particular adheres to. Okay, so there's some and sort of a chemical in the binding agent in, in, in the in the filter itself. Yes. Okay, mm-hmm. that binds DNA. Yes. Okay. And that from that filter, um, so you you know preserve that filter, and when the the time for analysis comes, you take that filter and you basically rinse or wash that DNA off the filter, and then you have all sorts of DNA floating around in, in your sample, resuspended, if you will. Um, and, you know, that from the mayfly to the striper to the algae to, to whatever else is in the water. Um, but then you, that's when you start using those, those particular cookie cutters. I'm working on a project right now in Southern California where we're looking for Southern California steelhead. You know, there's oh, very, yeah. very few of them. They come up these streams that are dry during the, well, for the most part during the summer, and then during winter, especially this winter, you have some huge flows and the water's brown and raging and you're trying to find, you know, whether there's yeah. five, 10 fish in there. So the eDNA seems to be the most promising approach. So in that particular case, we filtered water every other week at certain places throughout the watershed. And once the season's wrapped up in about a month or so, um, we'll take all those, all those individual filters and we dilute those and we put on that that steelhead shaped cookie cutter and see if there is any, you know, any piece of steelhead DNA, any, any steelhead fragment. Um, so that, that cookie cutter is a chemical, of course. And um, it's tuned for that specific and genome it's just or whatever. looking for steelhead. Yep. And what does it t- like change a color or what, how, no, do, how it, does it express? It basically, so you're looking for a, a DNA sequence and, and w- in the reaction, you're adding a, a primer mm-hmm. to that. Um, DNA dilution, mm-hmm. and that primer will only bind to steal its DNA okay. and replicate it hundreds of thousands and millions of times enough that you can see it. Yeah. And with with ev- the way the way that particular process works, with every rep- replication, if it can find something to bind to, when that chemical binds to it or that that artificial sequence binds to it, it usually releases a, a fluorescent probe that, if you shine a laser through it. It basically makes light, and that gives you a, a presence or absence. Hmm. Okay, so there, mm-hmm. the, there's a presence or absence, absence, which is basically just a binary yes or no, and yes. then, mm-hmm. and then based on the yes, you know that the sample you're dealing with is whatever target species, and that's is, how you figure it out. There, exactly. Wow, and you can do all this out just. There's a lab kit, I assume you guys use then. There is in your a, office. You don't have to send this to like you know Washington or something, CDC right, or something. Right now, we so we we specified the the process that we want used on those samples, and okay. we're doing the the collection and preservation right now, mm-hmm. and we are sending it off to a lab for analysis. Okay, um, but I'm hoping in the in the very near future that we can do that much more expeditiously. Yeah. Um, either in office or even in the field. So because the, the equipment's there now where you can do cheap that enough to yeah. within a matter of hours. That's mm-hmm. rad. And talking about technology evolving, I mean yeah. this, this eDNA has only been around for what, eighty five, five years now? Yeah. And it's yeah. not it's, it's not, not very new. Or it's it's quite new and um already we're seeing um people um sell um uh, eDNA specific units for fisheries. And so we were and talking about the, how the backpack e fisher looks like a, a Ghostbusters mm-hmm. backpack, you know, we're out there with the wand and everything. Well, that's kind of what this uh, eDNA sampler looked like. It's on a backpack and you're hmm. just, it's got a huge long wand and yeah, um, so that you're not in the water, you know, also when yeah. we're taking the sample. But yeah, I mean, this is, this is, new as it can get really for, I want, for tech if you guys want to build something cool just do like a um a wand about the size of say that pen that nick's holding and i plug it into my phone or maybe it's even got a little bluetooth receiver on it and i just dip the pen in the in, in the water and it tells me what what bugs are most prevalent so i can match a hatch 
<laughs> you guys want to be zillionaires? There you go. Yep, yep. I think we're still a few years away from that. Do you think that's even possible in the future? Mm, well, with eDNA, that's tough. Um, I mean, it would to be able to tell you what's in there, but it's not going to tell you which ones are most like which which ones are gonna are, are ready to hatch, or even which ones are most abundant because mm. uh, because of the fact that you're dependent on a water sample right with the dna in and it. the it's current hard, it's hard to tell how many individuals contributed dna yeah. to that sample and if you're not in the foam line you can't reach the foam line and the concentration of dna is going to vary greatly from bank to bank oh, i would yeah. assume and it yeah. settles down and yeah. you know, gets caught into sediment and so is that why you take so many different points of measurement to yes. kind of cover all those okay so that's that that's sense. one reason, and the other reason is we, if if steelhead show up in those streams that we monitor, we don't know when they're going to show up. They could show hmm. up in December. They could show up in April. That's why you know periodically yeah. we, we repeat those samples. Um, but yeah, you know, there's a lot of a lot of possibilities, and there's also a lot of limitations. One of the big ones is it's tough to interpret the eDNA stuff beyond presence absence, right? Because you so it, you might get a, a a positive hit and get a present to say whatever there's a carp in big chico creek but you don't know if there's one or a hundred um you know you could get a right. lot of you could get a lot of dna but that just might mean that you're close to the carp or there's a dead carp that's decomposing and releasing all sorts of the e dna um so yeah there's it has limitations but it certainly has its applications too that's where good old snorkeling comes into play <laughs> Another one of the oldest, the oldest tools Fins of the and trade. Flippers. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah. Your eyes, right? Visual yep. observations, um, and I mean that's that's something we use fairly frequently. Um, now and, cameras are becoming a lot more sophisticated, and that's oh yeah. a, is that where are we going right into that? Oh, we can, yeah, we can go right into that. Um, <laughs> so the, the the issue with the camera is that they're they're turbidity. Often, turbidity. And that they're often stationary, right? So you, the cameras work great for counting fish that are Traps going past a set point. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want to cover a large area to figure out how many fish there are, you know, in a whole stream or a stream reach, um, you can't get very far with cameras. You actually have to get get in the water because they need like a funnel point to basically make a camera trap, essentially, right? Pretty much, yeah. You need, yeah. You, and you need fish to move. You need fish to migrate. Right. Right. And if, if fish are hunkering down and just living living their lives in, in a pool and moving upstream and downstream a couple of hundred yards, chances that they go past your camera trap are, are pretty limited. So it works well for migrating fish like salmon, mm -hmm. um, other traps, not necessarily camera traps, but like downstream migrant traps, you know, work well for juvenile salmon and smolts. What would be an example they, of a downstream migrant trap? Like a rotary screw trap, if you've seen some of those in can the you, rivers. Can you describe those, what they look like? So a rotary screw trap is essentially like a big cone yeah. that's set in, in the water, and inside the cone is a, like a spiral. And so as the water comes into the cone, it forces it to spin. Looks like a concrete mixer almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and then as you know, fish enter that cone... Um, and it's it's spinning. They get trapped in those pockets of water that get forced to the back of the trap um, where there's a live well so or a live box. So um, you run the trap overnight. So technicians come in the morning, open up the live box, and count all the fish that they that were. And there. every time I've seen them on the river, they've always been in kind of you know similar where the the river seems to narrow. And then mm -hmm. open back up. So again, the, the funnel or the choke point kind of positioning it looks like when I where I've seen them. Yep. Right, and that's and that's to uh, maintain the trap efficiency. So you're wanting okay. you're wanting to um, basically you're, you're you're only able to estimate how many fish are moving past that trap. And so the more fish you can funnel into it, the better off you'll be. Right, you'll you'll have better counts. Uh, and then what fish. what kind of a sample sample size are you guys shooting for when you're doing the screw, screw trap stuff? Um, it just varies depending on day. Um, if it early in the early or very late mm. in the migration season, you might only get like two or three, um, uh, out migrants in a trap, but so you're just looking for presence more than anything. Not so much. Oh, numbers we, we, count, we count, we count, okay. we count yeah, them. we count okay. and measure them. Uh, but during the peak, you can have up to, you know, 10,000 fish in a trap. Okay. Day. And then in, th in those cases, we have to have people babysitting the trap, making sure that fish aren't getting too packed into what, that what what's the weirdest organic thing you found in a fish trap 
Deer Carcass was Ooh. a good one. Um, beaver from time to time. That those are not very happy about being <laughs> in there or removed usually. <laughs> Any otters? Um, I don't think otters are too smart. For I was that. gonna ask that yeah. same question in regards to the um, shocking. Um, what was your oh. biggest surprise <laughs> that popped beaver. up? Beaver. Yep, beaver. <laughs> a pissed beaver, off that, beaver. A very, very Holy angry shit. beaver. Um, <laughs> Those are the worst. I have seen um, cattle killed by an electroshocker oh, cat whoa. standing Damn, in the mud on the wet dude. bank. They're like, um, and it goes, and then falls over, and everybody's like, looks upstream, and they're like, not, shit. It was not pretty, and that was along the margins of a lake oh. where it just, you know, it was muddy and swampy, and there was cows grazing, and... Pro- proper precautions were not taken. That rancher prior was pissed. To sampling. Sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bessie, R.I.P. Okay. What's the what's the weirdest um, inorganic thing you found? Yeah, you man made objects. Oh well, that's difficult for trapping because inanimate Get objects everything. don't move. Man made stuff. Yeah, just float them. Trash. Trash. Generally. Yeah, there have been some needles. That was very unpleasant. Um, beer cans are fairly frequent. <laughs> um trying to think now i was i was fishing for like a dildo or something like that <laughs> well not, not trapping Just trying to keep it not family tra- friendly <laughs> <laughs> this is not a family friend well it sometimes is but you know um, i'm here so it's not really yeah no we found some we found some other stuff sampling in various backpacks um one particular incident that we refer to as finding the party pack um, that was <laughs> <laughs> nice. sampling on the Sacramento. Was, was it like wet? A, it was a, a fanny pack that was in the water. And I and field crews always give me a hard time about this, but whenever we see like any type of bag or anything, I always insist we pull it out and see what's in it. Mm-hmm. And in that one, it had just about any type of prescription medication that you can imagine including some syringes and needles some Jeez, mirrors that, some mysterious that powder, sounds like somebody got some, got chased and some, dumped their stash some condoms of all sorts and si- shapes and sizes various pipes a soft rubber tube Jeez. i'll let you interpret what that was <laughs> and a few other things so yeah, yeah that's a stash being tossed uh, i think yeah wow yeah, that was the the party Fun. pack that we found um gnarly yeah okay so how about um do you guys fabricate those screw traps yourselves or do you buy them because you guys do fabrication right yeah we do lots of fabrication the screw traps themselves they're usually made by a company in oregon um and they're they're pretty standard, and you know the the company in Oregon kind of makes makes them up yeah. and down the coast. Um, but we do a lot of fabrication for some of our other technologies, like our our camera traps. So when we put a camera trap in a river to you know count salmon that are migrating upstream, you have to place it at a choke point where you can funnel the fish through a fairly narrow chute, so you can actually see it and you know, calibrate it. Um, so we, we do the veer, weir fabrication for those, um, and the camera boxes and the, you know, the trap boxes and and that type of stuff. Yeah. When, when you guys first told me that you did fabrication, I was actually surprised, but it, I guess it, you know, it makes a lot of sense because every waterway is different and there's probably not, you know, there's probably not a specific thing that would fit all rivers. So you really have to just kind of tailor make it. Is that, is that really the reasoning you guys have even have a fabrication arm? That's pretty much the reason because, yeah, like you said, every river is different. Every For every application, you know, it has to withstand a, a different different type of flow. It has to have yeah. a different type of buoyancy. Sometimes you're looking for different fish. We were, some of the fabrication we're doing is, you know, goes – is applied outside of California, right? We've built a weir to monitor Atlantic herring, you know, and so this, the, the spacing between the pickets, for example, has to be much narrower for Atlantic – Atlantic herring that are you know 10 12 16 inches long compared to mm. to large chinook salmon that we're monitoring locally and i've seen pictures that that one where comes to mind where it had almost like an elevator in it where it would you you would like yeah. lower the camera unit down kind of like an elevator shaft sort of in a contraption is that one of the right. more complex that things was, you guys that was done? a very specialized yeah. vacky that we put in um and the reason we had it on an elevator system was it was going down into um Oh, a, a, a waterway or uh, what was it? It looked it? like it an, an out, 
an it, outlet, and like you had a damn like outlet. Super and high it, banks. You couldn't yeah, really walk yeah, up and to we it. Needed, uh, we needed it to. Oh, it was a very steep fish ladder. Yeah. I think is what it was. And um, in order to access it, we needed to be able to pull it out, pull it out quite a ways, and then mm-hmm. put it back in so that we could, you know, perform maintenance and whatnot on it. So, so that was like very, very specialized um, instance, you know, where we had to fabricate basically all the framing and everything yeah. to, to raise and lower that vacky. What um, and that vacuum being an, an infrared fish counter, basically. Mm-hmm. So an infrared scanner that scans fish um, as they swim by. And we also been uh, fabricating uh, fike traps. So what's that? A uh, fike trap is like think of a big tube, um, like almost the size of this room here. I know your audience can't get an idea. But Roughly what are they ten, about? ten by ten. Right, and. Uh, they basically on each end or on one end where the fish enters, you have a cone that goes into the trap and that funnels fish into the trap. Once they're inside that trap, uh, because the, the opening is actually fairly narrow compared mm-hmm. to the size of it. They, they kind of get confused and can't turn around and get back out. So of the it's trap. like an oversized crawdad trap or something. Yeah. 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 Or a, a, trap, or a bait or trap. Exactly. Trap, bait okay. trap, that kind of but stuff. Big. But big. So what, why, so why put them in that kind of a confined space? Like what, what do you, what's the purpose? So that's for like very big open water areas that we're trying okay. to sample. Okay. Um, and you just need to be able to put these traps out there. And that because there's so much area around, you just need a big trap. Okay. That makes sense. And then are they, um, are they suspended like on top of the water? Or are they submerged under buoys or how does that work? Uh, they're submerged mostly, but I think we have to leave a little bit of space out of the water in case a marine mammal or something gets in there so that they can come still up breathe. and get air. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they're, yeah. they're sitting on the bottom, but in fairly shallow water. I mean, mind you, those traps, you know, can have an eight foot diameter. So they're sitting in, you know, six, seven feet of water with okay. a little bit of a freeboard on top, up top. Do you ever, so how do they get in there if the holes that tiny? Well, I mean, it's a three foot, Oh, okay. compared to the a seal I mean, can get in there, no problem. Yeah, okay. I mean, we'll try to put Sorry, I was thinking over the like entrances. We'll try to put uh, brackets so that it kind of narrows the the passageway so yeah. that bigger animals and uh, mammals and stuff can't get in there, but the fish could still. I would assume it'd be there. like a big honey trap for for you know sea lions and <laughs> seals. It would be. That's kind of the problem, yeah, just though, because all the, this big bait ball stuck <laughs> in there, and they're like, "Let me in." <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, we're not permitted to sample those. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure we want to. Uh, yeah, it's a slippery slope to get into. Uh, okay. So, what else? Uh, is there any like? Uh, well, I you taught you 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 touched on the the infrared stuff, and I had questions around just machine vision kind of things. Uh, I guess related back to Nick's question about the cameras. So, you know, there's the, there's the camera traps are one thing, but let's talk about kind of like some of the software possibly, or some of the things that people may not be thinking about when it comes to that kind of stuff. Yeah. So what, one of the, the big challenges with using cameras, um, or, or be a video or, or photo cameras, um, is the very large amount or dead. Yeah, of, of manpower it takes to actually turn, you know, hours and hours or days worth of video into something useful. And there's certainly a, a push towards automating, you know, that some of that video review, um, or, or some of that image review. So the, the actual fish expert, you know, doesn't have to sort through tons of images with leaves and twigs and whatever else floating by, but can yeah. focus on the images that actually contain fish. Um, so yeah, that's something that's yeah. under development, um, to, to streamline that whole process. Cause yeah. video is great cause yeah. you can, you know, remotely deploy it and have it run for, well, continuously. Um, but yeah, the, the big hurdle to making it really efficient is still the, the time commitment it yeah. currently takes to, to review all that and turn it into something And it, it's useful. similar. Well, like what you're talking about is similar to what say home security, so home security is doing with the doorbell cameras, right? Where you can review a 24 hour segment of footage, but it will only show you the highlights, like the people actually coming up to your door. So they they take 24 hours, they compress it down to just the events that were at your door. And that might be like two and a half minutes of stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Right. But it's not from a, uh, for fisheries applications is not quite that easy, right? Cause right. in front of your door, yeah, it might show you, you know, yeah. a cat and a dog walking by as yeah. well. Um, 
But if you if you try to take underwater footage, do you have I a mean, lot of things floating by that are of no light. interest to you? Yeah. Um, so sorting through those, mm-hmm. yeah, is, is a big challenge, um, and that is yeah certainly something that that I would expect to be automated and be become much more efficient in the near future. Do you guys know today how turbidity sensors work by any chance? So I've always wondered. Roughly. I mean, it it basically, it it takes a water sample, um, you know, from whatever, imagine the tar black and crystal clear Fiji Mm -hmm. water or something. Mm -hmm. Um, And you you basically shine a laser through it and however much light makes it out the other end, that's calibrated to give you a reading. So it's it's light penetration. Oh, Mm -hmm. that's easy enough. (laughs) <laughs> Every once in a while, they're just seemingly. I thought easy it was just going to be some black magic stuff, but no, not quite. I mean, I, I don't know the you know the f- exact physics behind it, but so it's, what a, it's light based, okay. laser based. How come more rivers don't have that turbidity reading on them? On the gauges, with, yeah. On the gauges, because with any sensor, it, once once you put sensors in, um, especially the break. ones that are that need to be visually accurate um it's a lot of maintenance requirement because mm-hmm. you get you know if you get an algal film over your your mm-hmm. laser window right, right. Uh, it doesn't yeah, give yeah, you, yeah, you know, yeah. so they make them now with wipers it <laughs> no helps way. a little bit yeah, that's yeah. funny but yeah still unless it's absolutely necessary and crucial mm-hmm. um they they limit the turbidity sensors just because the maintenance is so high tyler looks like he's got something to say down there oh i was just going to comment that like Right now, you know, when we're out in the field and we're um, interested in taking turbidity samples, we don't have a probe that we stick in the water to measure turbidity. We take a water sample and we take it back to the office, take it back to the lab, um, and then run it there. So So you shake it back up and then put it in? Okay. Yeah. Huh. So Miguel, how many, Michael, sorry. Miguel. That's all right. You guys been hanging out with uh, the taco Taco guy. (laughs) (laughs) Michael, what about um, tags for fish? There's so many different kinds and we've talked about them before on the show, but let's. Like fish tags? I I need to be reminded about them. Like fish tags. Yeah, no, tags of of all sorts of shapes and sizes are a hugely important tool for, for fisheries biologists. Um, there's a vast, you know, vast number of different types of tags. Um, how is one, that, how has that technology first changed over the last 50 years? Um, fish have always been, not always, but fish, fish tagging goes a long ways back. Mm-hmm. Um, but back in, you know, in the early days, the, the tags that are used to either identify individual fish or identify a, a batch of fish were external and it was some type of hardware, you know, some, some people may have seen um, spaghetti tags, so they're like that little, little green the, the stick little, that yeah, sticks out of the back out of the, of the fish. dorsal fin, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so fish, you know, can be captured again. You have to get your hands for any type of tag. Usually, you have to get your hands on the fish to mm-hmm. be able to tag them. Mm-hmm. Um, but in a at a lot of weirs, for example, um, they used to tag fish. Trinity River being an example, when they came, when fish come through the Trinity River weir. Um, a portion of them will be tagged and then, you know, be allowed to continue their journey upstream. And, you know, when you tag the fish and you see at the upstream end, like the hatchery, when those fish arrive, so you get a rough idea of transit time. Um, if you find tags and fish that are, you know, deceased in river, um, you can estimate some pre-spawn mortality, um, do population estimates, that sort of stuff. And there's all there's different types of external tags. There are disc tags that basically look like a, a couple of washers um, on either side of the fish that may have a different color or a unique color, or a unique number on them um, to individually identify them. Hmm. And of course, there's a batch tagging, right? We all know about adipose fin clip or adipose um, clipped fish. So external tagging, easily recognizable. Um, is still still a very very important tool, um, and and maybe use that. And maybe I can use that opportunity to tell people if you find tagged fish and that's not not adipose fin clipped, but t- fish that have an individual tag on them, be it a spaghetti tag or a disc tag or something else, um, please return those tags. That's very very valuable <laughs> yes, information. So even if the fish is alive, though. Well, you can still, you can write down whatever number it oh, says okay. on the tag and says, right. I caught this fish then and this was the tag. I've actually caught one like that in the Truckee. So okay. if it's a wild fish and you f- it's tagged and you catch it, 
write down that information, take a picture of it, and get that information back in. If it's yeah. adipose fin clipped and you can keep a hatchery steelhead, yeah, then you can keep it if you want. Thing. And yeah. return, okay. Don't call your local game warden about every when, clipped fish you catch. Who would we if send? it has an actual tag, please make sure you, you report it. Who do we send that info to? Um, the tags usually include information on who's conducting the study so if okay. we put out fish with spaghetti tags it'll say fish bio on them okay um and different agencies different entities will will make sure to maximize their chances to get yeah. their tags returned and, and the one i saw um kind of looked like a piece of i don't know wire with conduit on it it, yep. it, it was it, but it was a little more floppy but it had it definitely had numbers printed on it's it a spaghetti mm -hmm. tag a spaghetti tag. okay yeah. So is it was there ever money associated with these things? Sometimes there is. Yeah. Um, I think isn't it on the on the it's Trinity, right? Like a bounty. Um, yeah, yeah. You get you get twenty bucks or ten bucks or whatever. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you if you return a tag, because a huge amount of effort and resources go into right getting your hands on those fish and tagging them. And, and it's a lot more valuable than ten bucks with the intention of learning <laughs> something from it, right? right? And and the more the more tags you get returned, the more you can learn from it. Hmm. But then. There's a, well, definitely a huge, huge range of applications for tags that you cannot see as the angler that catches the fish. So internal tags. Those are the P. P the PIT tags, pit yeah, tag, P-I-T. Yeah. So yeah. it's a passive integrated transponder mm -hmm. is what it is. They, they range in size, you know, from fairly small grain of rice to size of a bean or something. And basically it's a, it's a wire coil, an encased wire coil that doesn't have a battery. Um, but that gets activated or, or energized by passing through a magnetic or an electric field. And it'll actually bring, mm. bring, bring back a barcode, like a number for exactly. you that yeah. you, mm. that yep. you can so, write down. Yep. Think, we think about the tags that's in your pet and your dog and your cat. It's same. exactly the same, same thing. thing. Yep. Okay. Yeah, we were um, using a big, thick syringe and injecting those into the hatchery steelhead and um, on the feather. It's pretty mm. cool. Neat process. Yeah, the the really cool thing about those, is, well, for one, they stay in the fish for quite a long time there is some some tag loss especially with you know spawning fish whatever because they're just in the body cavity um but they are individuals so you can really identify repeat captures mm -hmm. of of individual fish <laughs> and you can have those captures passively if you will you can have an antenna on the stream bed and if the fish swims over it gets recorded and tells yeah, i was gonna you, ask dude did you see one six eight seven look how big it is now man it's a freaking toad <laughs> yeah i was gonna ask uh, how how close you had to be proximity wise to get a read on those but it sounds like pretty close a couple feet yeah 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 you got about 20 inch maybe <laughs> yeah yeah depending but on for, the strength of your antenna too yeah. you, you guys should start an instagram profile for each fish with a tag in it and then and then Nick Nick's thing could could be pretty awesome because you could just tag that fish when you caught it and then let it go. Start naming them. Yeah, mm -hmm. you could. You could. I mean, the, in no? in other okay. places <laughs> of the world, I've I've seen similar things where you can you know you can sponsor or adopt a fish or whatever you know an individual tag you pay mm -hmm. for the tag and then whatever you can name your white shark or whatever it may be and uh, as they track it. Um, mm. Yeah, we're not quite there. Yet. <laughs> we're not if, quite if there. We yet. Had, if we had the GPS tags, like if those were small enough that we could like oh, buy them cool. and put them into a fish, yeah, surgically. That might happen at some point. Yeah. It's yeah. Just like It'd powered off a of cool. kinetic energy or something, you know. Yeah. So there's plenty of that in those fish. Yeah. That's, that's true. But then still for, for the GPS to work, you kind of have to be at the surface. That doesn't work below water. True. Um, when you see like biologists standing on a bridge with a big antenna array, what are what are they using those? Mm. They're for? tracking also internally tagged fish, but telemetry tagged fish. So they're radio tags. So those are actual tags that have a battery and unfortunately a limited battery life associated with them. Um, but those tags actively give off signals so you can follow those fish and track those fish actively i think we talked about this making me think about the mad river hatchery the steelhead that were in the hatchery then they were tagged and put out in the ocean or near the ocean and then in like minutes or hours they were right back <laughs> up the river did we talk about that i'm not saying i don't remember i don't remember okay I thought that but was i don't you, remember Michael. what i ate yesterday so um but in any case with the you know with the telemetry tag the the good thing is you can actively find a fish. You can actually right. go, yeah. go and look for them. With the pit tags, the passive tag, the cool thing is they last indefinitely. There's no battery to run out. But in order to detect the fish, you either have to capture it and scan it, or it has to swim over one of your antennas. What, what's the minimum size 
required to put a pit tag in a, in a fish? About 60 mm. millimeters, so two and a half inches or so. Okay. Oh, huh. so, so pretty small. Fairly small. So they're, so they're like small a grain ones. of rice big? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Wow. That's um, pretty rad. Yeah. It's they're, it's a very, very cool technology. Um, it's been around for a bit? Yeah, it's been around for, I don't know, at least a couple decades, I think. Mm-hmm. I mean, they they get progressively smaller and whatever they're encapsulated in, you know, gets progressively more robust and durable. Yeah. Um, but the pit tack technology itself has been around for a while, um, but not not as inexpensive or or as durable and and reliable as it is now Hmm. what else um so there's also another type of tag um internal tag called coated wire tags um these are basically uh microscopic wire filaments that are um, stamped with the unique number um and they put these in all in a lot of the hatchery fish um, and they put them in the snouts of the fish. And the, that way, when um, adult spawners are recovered oh. um, on their spawning grounds, um, they using uh, carcass surveys and whatnot, they can collect the heads of those dead fish. So it's like the then, last thing to decompose or be eaten pretty yeah, much. <laughs> yeah, and so they can, so they can ke- keep those heads um, and send them off to a, a lab to be processed. So they pull out those tags, and then that's how you can – figure out um from which hatchery different individuals came from that's 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 pretty cool those are now being there's actually trucks that pull up and then all the hatchery smolt get thrown into basically a bucket and run down a funnel and through an assembly belt and tags are being thrown into them one by one it's pretty crazy that they can even do that you know automated it's that's awesome and it's really when did that become available like because before that i'm guessing you just one by one had to take a Manually, yeah, it yeah. used to be mm. used to be manual. Um, the the high throughput, a few, yeah, few years, a couple years, yeah, decade, couple yeah. decade or and so. The it's fairly really, new to me, even yeah. though it's been around a while. So yeah, the manual, the manual has been around for right, you know, m- much longer. But yeah, if you can imagine the effort, you know, if you produce have a hatchery, produce a couple hundred thousand 50, salmon, yeah, or fifty million salmon, you know, how do you <laughs> Jesus. how do you tag? Yeah. Uh, an appreciable proportion of those you have to you have to automate it is there any um, um oh go ahead let finish your thought um well my if i finish my thought it's going to lead to the next thought so you better ask <laughs> well i was going to ask like <laughs> if uh, well let, let's keep going down this track because i think what i'm about to ask will get us on a different one so go ahead um so one of the the cool things about the the coded wire attack that's that tyler was talking about is it allows you to to reconstruct a, a hatchery of origin, right? So usually every mm-hmm. every hatchery has a unique tagging code, and every release group or most release groups have a unique code. Um, so if you find those fish, regardless of where you find them, you can trace those back to wherever they were produced. Uh, Sourcing, and, and that's how that's how they actually track um, straying rates. So is this so, this is going back to source sync, right? Is um, this what, no. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't. Are we going back no, to that? No, or are we no, just starting? We, we'll with talk that? about it later. We'll talk we haven't about talked it about it yet, but yeah. But yeah, so you can if you if you see a you know if you see fish, salmon in particular in a in a given river in fall, and you can um, trace back where those salmon were produced. It may turn out, and it often does turn out, that the river you find them in as adults is not the river where where they were originally produced. What's the percentage mm-hmm. of that? You, you, Varies from year to year, yeah. actually. Mm. Mm-hmm. Can't um, be very large, though. Yes, it can be. Um, straying rates. I uh, don't quote me specifically on these numbers, but I think like um, natural levels are around six percent. Um, but with hatchery influences, it can get quite higher, like up to fifteen or twenty. So six percent we... of the wild fish are lost. Well, generally, like stray between. Uh, tributaries. Did we define what stray rates mean? Not going, recall. not going back to the, not going back to your place of birth to reproduce. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. Um, are we good on that? Because no, I'm going to ask this question now. Um, is there any technology that you've seen either at a conference or read about that's coming that you're excited about that you're not currently employing in the field? Tough question. Dun, dun, that is a good dun, question. Dun, dun, dun. I mean, I'm definitely excited about the camera stuff. Um, 
and p- particularly if the the software and the um, that stuff gets to the point where you could actually take underwater photos and actually be able to identify the different species mm-hmm. um, that you get in in, in the f- footage. I think that's uh, it would be really cool to do, and I think there's people that are trying that kind of stuff right now too. Um, you know, stuff that that I have seen, and this is more from a from a habitat type perspective, and that's something that just I know it's out there. It's just not readily available yet, but is um, satellite and, and habitat mapping, um, in particular when it comes to to stream temperature. You know, the, all the, mm-hmm. the ocean fishermen, all the tuna guys, they're always keeping an eye on this, like, sea surface temperature and stuff. And all that's pretty much, it's possible to do it, you know, for, for a small creek. If you had the right satellite in the right place, you can figure out what Antelope Creek temperature is, you know, 10 miles up from the Sacramento. Um, right now, we have to run out there and, and stick your <laughs> thermometer in. But you could, in theory, you could do all that remotely. Mm-hmm. And once that becomes much more accessible and more readily available. Um, I think it would allow us to get a, a much, much better overview of how limiting the habitat really is. Right. Just from a, just from a, you know, habitable zone perspective, mm-hmm. right? Exactly. Um, in the, is there a government agency or someone that's like working on deploying satellites or what, whatever it would take to do something like this? Do you know? I'm not sure. I'm sure the, the the right satellites are out there. There's a couple government agencies that are you know working in that direction. There's some really good stream temperature models out there, but it's based on based on collected data and extrapolated. Um, so both the the USGS and the Forest Service have some really good models, and those are actually available online. You can yeah um, yeah you they've can got check those out. They've got a network of um, uh, temperatures across across the country and uh, in in all the different streams and stuff. And so they've been building that data um, for a few years now. They've been That's really cool. working on building that network of of uh, temperature sensors all around the country. Now, I know the Navy's heavily involved with that because they need to. They're checking to see what their sonar does to different marine life, right? Hmm. So they're always kind of monitoring that a little bit. And so they're, I mean, they're spending money on that stuff too. But as far as the government's on it, that's the only thing I've heard of. Hmm. Yeah, other than that, exciting new technologies, I'm not sure. I'm hoping to learn about a couple new things in that uh, an upcoming conference. There's a big so the one in problem, Reno, the one in Reno. Yeah, yeah it's probably I'm gonna try the, and go to that. You should. It's it's cool. Like you you know if you uh, ever feel weird in your group of friends for being a fish nerd. Yeah, there's like <laughs> oh, there's, yeah, it's like going to a fur, it's like going people to a furry just furry like convention you. or something. <laughs> yeah, it makes you feel really good. We should go to that. I'm. It, when it's is gonna it? Be good. It's in, in September. That, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. All right. So what's the most with, with respect to tools and tech, you know, tools of the trade and, and being out in the field, what's the most mundane, repetitive part of the job? Mm. If you ever have to do bug samples, ugh. picking bug <laughs> samples is is very mundane and monotonous. But fun if you like bugs, like flipping rocks and and pulling bugs. Well, yeah, you're you've got. Uh, bug samples that you collect from the water and then you take them back to the lab and have to identify the actual sorting or if you're doing a diet study and you're like digging through gut contents right you just Okay, well, bug. when bug. when you guys there's said bug. you're sending the se- severed heads back to the lab to think <laughs> to go through, <laughs> not us. like who I would not want that effing job. Can you imagine? You just get like bags of rotting oh, fish rotting heads, heads and you got to yeah. just pick through them yeah. and yeah. run them through Jesus. a scanner. Oop. And it beeps. Oh yeah, tags in there. Cut, uh, the, cut the head in oh, half. Do them, and we'll it, do them again. And it must it just half. smell amazing in that lab. Oh yeah, I like, think you can't even imagine. Yeah, you have to. That's got to be the worst. Have that's, some resilience. That's got to be on the dirty jobs uh, <laughs> series. That well, job wasn't that wasn't the, uh, the like Feather River Carcass Survey on that. there? Yeah, yeah, a yeah, few like years that. back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've seen them out there stabbing yeah. old carcass salmon and bringing yeah. them on boat, chopping them in half. Yeah. <laughs> um all right so let, let's get let's talk about um sh- what's it called sink source source, source sink, sink dynamics and what, it, and what is it what does that mean and salmon populations or any populations for that matter what does that um, mean so a source um well it's fairly self-explanatory where where the fish come from um but then there's also population sinks which where fish kind of fish production disappears into um 
where you don't really get any any return on your investment. So an, an example of that um, would be, you know, not to to harp on on the hatcheries too much, but that is the most the most prolific example, at least here in the Central Valley, is hatcheries produce a lot of fish, and a lot of those fish don't necessarily go back to the hatcheries, but go back to other places, places that might not under current conditions or under natural conditions, not have any or as many fish. But because so many fish go back there, even though they weren't produced there, it seems like those streams are doing really well. It's like, oh, look, all of a sudden we have, you know, 5,000 salmon in this stream. In this stream. And they, they spawn and there's juveniles going out, but it may not be the juveniles that are the fish that are produced in that stream that actually come back. You know, three years later, all the juveniles die on their way out, just kind of hypothetical extreme right. example. Yep. Yet three years later, you still have 5,000 fish come back. And you may think everything's fine, yet you only think that because year after year, you get fish from a, a source population, an overflow into some of these other other streams. You're effectively getting their sink? Yes. Is that a way to no, look they're at the it? source. They're the source. The hatcheries. The hatcheries are the, are the okay. source. Okay. So... Okay. They're, they're, so the hatcheries are producing fish, and I should, you know, again, I don't want to harp on the hatcheries, but because they're so effective, I mean, they they're good at what they do. They yeah. pump out. What's a the lot percentage of, fish of salmon versus wild, like generated for a population of the Feather River, for example? Seventy percent. Um, oh, of hatchery produced yeah. fish versus. I in think river we need to fish. let's let's define what it means first, because we we were you know we we're talking about it before we hit record because there was a question. About because that that's kind of like the foundation of for his question I think um, if let me let me just read what this this person said on Instagram hold on if I can unlock my phone doesn't like me with headphones on for some reason okay uh, which came first the hatchery egg or the wild fish is a hatchery fish not wild egg raised in hatchery I think basically what the question is is <laughs> is um, <laughs> what what's the definition of a wild fish versus a hatchery fish because we talked about two hatchery fish out migrating then three years later coming back the same two hatchery fish then then spawning in gravel in the river below the hatchery and is that that offspring is that a wild fish or is that a hatchery fish so what's the definition are you talking about steelhead now because that same fish isn't going to come back i would just say it it applies to both right okay yeah both yeah Yeah. okay um and essentially that that is the that's the offspring of a hatchery and a naturally spawning or um, in river spawning fish is what the answer to that question is. So, hatchery fish is fish that's produced, raised in the hatchery, and either released at the hatchery into the river or trucked out mm-hmm. um, and released. And then, if it when it returns, it's still that adult is still a hatchery fish. Yep. But if it um, mates with another fish in the river, it's considered a natural spawn from the hatchery. In river. Even if the the parent was from the hatchery. Yeah, I'm saying mommy and daddy are both both mommy both and adult daddy hatchery fish. Are, ha- are would be hatchery fish, but that offspring would be the offspring of so, a hatchery. So fish. really, the definition is where the egg hatched. But it's an in river. Yeah, is that right? And and that's only a default definition because okay. we because yeah. there's no way to tell. Yeah. yeah you okay. Can't, after that, you can't tell. So right. then that gets to that gets to Nick's question. Then so genetically speaking, you said seventy percent, right? We're 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 hatchery, and the remainder were right. wild. Not genetically, just in, as far as the run goes. How many, so to, to, to refine that, how many of the Feather River, what? Salmon, salmon returning. Or salmon hat- returning yeah. were produced in the hatchery yep. versus in river? Yep. Well, I probably. don't have a good percentage on that, but I would, I, the majority. Just guess. Probably them. all. The majority. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So even, so even if you're seeing out of post fin on fish, the idea, the, it's very likely that genetically it was, spawn and hatchery at some point well yeah. and that's downline that's another tricky thing about this is that um mm. the hatcheries only mark they only add clip 25 percent right of the fish okay. so okay. It, yeah so there's a lot of hatchery fish out there that haven't that have no extra right. marking right. that you yeah you, right. you just can't tell them apart um that was one of my pet peeves i had a, a few visitors um from europe with me last fall and they wanted to go salmon fishing because I told them if they came visit me, they could they could catch a king salmon wearing flip flops. Um, <laughs> That's quite a statement. Yeah, well, we did, we promise. did, but yeah. So we 
and and we went with a guide and we caught some fish and they had their adipose fin intact mm -hmm. and with every fish we caught the guide would say it's like oh look another beautiful wild fish <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and you don't really you don't know yeah you, when it is ad clipped you do know it's a hatchery fish when right. it's not it may be you just don't know but it sounds like it sounds better there but it sounds like <laughs> if you're if we're going to get really specific about ge genetics that it's probably a hatchery offspring down de down the, from somewhere down the line yes in the yeah. sacramento and, and i would say yeah and, I, and that was the other point i was going to make california and then as you move you know north that probably is less likely is that right it's just, basically it's a matter of where the hatchery concentrations are yeah, I don't think there's necessarily a, a north-south gradient because, yeah. I mean, no other state tops Alaska in hatchery yeah. production, you know, especially when you get into other species of, of salmon for, for pink salmon and, and, and chum salmon, et cetera. They have huge, huge hatchery production. Um, it just is watershed specific. You know, you can go to watershed, watersheds where you have very limited hatchery influence, even though there might have been historically a hatchery that operated for a few years in the past, like, whatever redwood creek, yeah. redwood creek or the eel river or something like that um where you don't have st even local even in you know in california you don't have a, a big hatchery influence yeah and that, and then that kind of raises another question in my mind if you've got let's say there's been three generations of fish that are hatchery fish they've been you know in raceways and then they were released somewhere as small um three generations they're they're all producing and then finally on the fourth generation those adults come back and they they were actually spun that well i guess the third generation offspring were in the were born in the river right then they out migrate they come back in they have kids are those kids are they more genetically conditioned for waste ray habitats because of the the last three generations or because they're they're, they're they were born in the river you know are they going to be is it going to be okay like how how far from center genetically and from an adaptation perspective, is a is a you know an in river fish versus a hatchery fish, and so on. I think I'm, that was the longest question I've ever asked, but it, did yeah. it make sense? I think there's a, a fairly simple but generic answer okay. to it. Um, hatch domestication or you know hatchery effects, yeah. if you yeah. if you will, is something that happens very very quickly. Okay. So even you know even after a generation. Okay. There, you just select for different traits, or for that matter, you don't weed out the stuff that wouldn't make it in river, right? Because that's the whole point. Is mm -hmm. like you increase survival to the extent possible. Um, but there's some some fairly rigorous evidence out there that when those fish come back, even if they mate with a wild fish, so a hatchery mm -hmm. fish coming back, adult mates with a wild fish coming back, mm -hmm. that their offspring the mutts, if you want to call it that, yeah. um, are less successful than the wild fish, wild fish pairing. Oh, okay. Interesting. So it doesn't, it doesn't take much to have okay. an effect. And then can they, can they equally bounce back faster? I mean, if let's say it's a, it's a hatchery in a wild and then their offsprings kind of 50, 50, and then they get diluted genetically in future generations with wild fish. Well, are they, well, will they come back the other way? So this is, I don't know, kind of getting back to the source sink um, topic here is that's that's the problem we're running into is now even all of the because there's been so many hatchery fish right. released and right. the straying has been so high all of the wild fish now show uh, very little genetic differentiation difference from from the hatchery fish yeah so it's all kind of big one swirl like one yeah the one that stands out the most hatchery. is that winter run right mm-hmm probably out of yeah. all of them yeah but as a spring run still too like they still have some uh genetic differences between the hatcheries mm -hmm. um so there's still some genetic variation out there but at you know the the fall run um it's it's the, the fact is that there's salmon um, from all these different all these hatcheries yeah and at the same time and mixed at the, at the, and there's right. just no there's no difference now between san joaquin and right. sacramento hmm. uh, so mm. sp speaking of springers Speaking of oh, spring, yeah. spring oh. in general, I spent a lovely day various throughout the day, various hours throughout the day on Big Chico Creek, and it was an right absolute, through town here in Chico, right through town, and it was an absolute delight. Why is it that, was, Mike? There's 
Well, for one, there's so many, so many different things going on. Like on top of every, in every tail out and on top of every riffles, there's, you know, large schools of suckers getting ready to spawn mm -hmm. now. There's just big slabs of like pike minnow and hardhead that must have moved up from the Sacramento doing circles, looking for a place to spawn. There's steelhead smolts that are, you know, smashing mayflies off the surface on their way to the ocean. Um, so cool. There's yeah, there's so much life right now and readily visible because the river, you know, the the creek is running super clear, and um, there's some spring run salmon in Big Chico Creek. You the, showed me a picture of one at yeah, just below Sycamore Pool, right? Just below Sycamore Pool, Airborne trying to jump the weir. Yeah, basically, is a really really cool shot. We'll put it up. Yeah. pretty soon. Didn't didn't quite make it. It takes them a, a few attempts. There's a so there is a fish ladder there. They can't they can make it up. Um, I watched a few fish go up successfully today, and just takes them takes them a few tries to to find the right spot to make it through. Um, but yes, there's, there's spring run salmon in big Chico Creek. It's That's a, really a cool. great, great opportunity to watch them. Um, difficult to, to figure out where they're going to be, you know, for, for any length of time yesterday. Um, they were right behind the card center today. They could um, be in the park today. Well, I saw fish moving up through the ladder this morning. Um, they're, you know, somewhere throughout lower park still. I don't know if this is one bunch of fish moving through if this is the tail end of it or if there's there's more to come yeah. um but there was probably about 30 yesterday that's so cool and it fascinating absolutely fascinating because you have this you know little creek that's whatever knee to, to thigh deep and where they hang out just in line you know there's just a school right where you can see them and i was standing there with my camera and you know people would walk by and say oh what are you looking at I was like oh there's you know 30 12 to 20 pound fish like right there <laughs> it's like oh i don't see anything it's like yeah there every once in a while you know one would dart out and you yeah. could see it and then the school school would kind of swirl and yeah. then reposition itself and you could see them um but yeah amazing how how well those fish blend and how well and these are strays hide. right well, yeah, talk you, about you make, that. make yeah. your make up your own mind. Well, with there, the, with there the drought were... and very little salmon being counted in the yeah, last ten years so... in that stream, these are these fish have basically popped out of nowhere. Yep. So Big Chico Creek did not have any spring run. So spring run salmon has a, have a fairly strict three year life history. So mm -hmm. the fish that spring run that come back are three years old, and there were not any spring run in Big Chico three years ago. So they must be coming from somewhere. Um, Just add water. Add water and they what won't find their way home. Or, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. <That's laughs> funny. Just, just add water. If, and they, if you wet you know, it, they will come. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Na so nature finds a way. Man. There, That's let's what say, I've been saying for a long time. Let's say that you just saw those thirty, and there's only thirty in the system. And they go up and they spawn, and like all their smolt get out. Are they going to come back in three years and spawn? They might, you know, that's, that's the How thing. How does that work? Now Even they, if, if they make if, it if out. If the parent's not there, if it's not the natal stream of the parent, the parent still heads up that stream because they're confused. They have kids. Now are those kids imprinted on that, that yes. watershed? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. They so imprint cool. on the like chemical cue of so that cool. watershed. But okay. yeah, there's a lot of variables involved between then and yeah, so now in, and in, then. In three and, years. So I don't, hmm. it's, that question has always been of interest to me. That kind of you know source sink. So like yeah, yeah. Three, three years ago there weren't any any spring run salmon in Big Chico Creek. So those must be coming from somewhere else. Battle Creek, Feather River, Deer Clear Creek, Deer. I saw it, Butte yeah. Creek. Who knows where those fish came from, right? Um, and you know they might make it. Hopefully they will make it up high enough so they can find some deep cool water to make it through the summer and spawn successfully this fall. And hopefully their juveniles will make it out um, um, next spring. Yeah. But there's no way of telling whether in three years Big Chico Creek will have enough water so that the adults can come back then. Um, and hopefully nobody poaches them. And if you ever do see somebody poaching, call 1-800-CAL-TIP. Because I have seen people poaching yeah. fish, salmon particularly, out of creeks <laughs> like that. It's bad. It's it's, yeah, you know, it's and because the, the water's low and clear, it's too easy. kids can see them. And they're like, "Oh, look at these fish!" You know, yeah, and it's, it's the worst. No, and they're cool, and they're yeah, readily available and, and visible right now. And yep. yeah, they they try to hunker down, especially during the day, um, in places where they can somewhat hide. And yeah, don't I I tried to keep and did successfully keep some people from throwing sticks and, and rocks. To, you know, move the right. fish into the water so where they could see them and stuff. They need to have signage all the way up and down that creek yes, to educate people because they don't even know. They just don't. Absolutely. Yeah, people know. don't know. They there's don't, no, there's no, no idea. bad intention oh, behind it. it. Right. 
Um, yeah, there. I mean, there's a there's a river in. I'm not going to say the river, but in near Reading, where they have good signage up, and and they just don't do that here. It's really crazy to me. Yeah, well, maybe because there's not enough. Maybe it's because it's it happens too infrequently. Right. You know, like yeah. I said, three years ago there weren't any. There, I think the last time Big Chico Creek um, had an appreciable count of spring run salmon was in 2011. Yeah, well, they I were helicoptering fish from lower pools all the way up to the upper pools to get them out of the warm water because they mm. got trapped. The water dropped too quick. They were down in the lower. Was sections this before I moved up here? Probably, and they yeah. couldn't get up there. And I mean, if they're spending that mm. much time and effort. To do that, you could think you could buy some fucking signs. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, seriously, come on, you're gonna buy jet fuel and all this shit and pay a helicopter guy, right? Put some signs up, yeah, for fuck's sake. yeah. But in any case, if you see them, appreciate them, yeah, enjoy it, um, yeah, don't bug them, right? Yeah, that's cool. No, so in in any case, I you know don't don't mean to to portray, um. Big Chico Creek in, in this particular example as as this place where where salmon go and nothing ever comes out of it. So this this no no return on investment um, deal or this this population sink. Um, yeah, we don't know what's going to happen to those fish, and maybe maybe yeah. their juveniles make it out, their offspring make it out, and and they do come back in three years and they can't go up Big Chico. Yeah, but maybe maybe they can go up you know they'll they'll find yeah. a different place they'll go somewhere else yeah 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 and, and maybe we just, they they will find a place where they couldn't go up this year and there's no production this year mm-hmm. but they can go up 3 years from now so it's just you know kind of diversifying that that life history and and that that portfolio if you will of of, yeah. of salmon do you I, I should know the answer to this but is there are there any fish barriers on big chico as we as we head up the canyon yes there are so there's a defunct fish ladder the iron canyon fish ladder that has that was initially constructed to um make upper big chico creek accessible during a broader range of flows so you know before before anything was done in the canyon spring run salmon could get up there but only if the flows were just right and that would only happen in i don't know 10 20 percent of years so they they built a fish ladder um up in the canyon that improved that or made it more accessible during, yeah. during a, a wider range of flows yeah um but that fish ladder is now defunct if you will um there i think it was in part due to earthquakes like the thing crumbled and it's you know t- fragments and pieces and rebar yeah and it's it's worse than it was before and there used to be there were plans there still are plans um to, to fix that but it it failed because of insufficient funding do you know um who that was that was working on it many there was a collaboration many different agencies from the department of water resources to yeah, I wonder uh, to national marine fish yeah because i i saw salmon in uh right be, right behind the the card center last year mm-hmm. uh or maybe a year and a half the year before last i think i sent you or mike a picture of the guy jamming up the creek um so they're in there. They're present when, like you're saying, the conditions permit it. So why wouldn't we do something there? You know, they they put one on Deer Creek. They redid that one. They did, and it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. They did an amazing job. So if you guys are um, want to go see what a new fish ladder looks like, go go hike up down Deer Creek if from 32 down to the Lower Falls. Um, is it Lower Falls? Yeah, it's lower the Lower Falls. falls. Yeah. Uh, just below Lower Falls, I believe, or is it? Yeah. Is it yeah. below? It's just the, about, it, it, just it, below. It, it. it circumvents the, the lower. Yeah, it's got to be basically. below it. Gets, it, duh. <laughs> it. It's at it's at the lower yeah, falls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go check it out, you guys. Uh, it's a it's a pretty easy hike. It's a couple like a mile and a half, two miles in from thirty two. Um, you know, you can take your dog. Go check it out. Uh, okay, so what else are you guys working on? What are you excited about right now? What's in What's on the hopper? What's in the screw trap, so to speak? Well, right now I'm um, working on. 20 years of data of rotary screw trap data from one of our rivers in the San Joaquin um, and trying to throw as many statistics at us as I can to see it, to make sense of, you know, what's driving the differences in um, out migrations from year to year. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're looking at everything from like the amount of water every year to um, like even, even like how much, moonlight there was in a particular night you mm. know how much does that those external variables help us predict what uh the number of fish that are migrating out are so we can use that then to help um help understand management like um, yeah. um 
management activities of the you know on that river. Well, I guess that kind of like leads me to a tools of the trade question. What are you doing the analysis in software wise? Oh, um, I use um, R R Studio. So R is the statistical environment, and um, the R Studio is kind of the um, the pull it all together. So make, ID, make it it's an IDD. It's base. an IDD. Yeah, 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 yeah. right. Inter- integrated Inter- development environment. Exactly. So yeah, you yeah. do you you program that? I didn't know you did that. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. So you're writing. It's ba- for those listening. It's basically a programming language that st- statisticians use. Did I say that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, correct. Um, to basically, you know, answer questions that they have that there may not be software out in the market that's been designed to do it because usually there's not enough market to build something commercially viable. So you have to you get a guy like Tyler and he can build stuff for you ad hoc because it's yeah very specific. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Um, how about you, Mike? Um. Well, new up and coming. The one, the one thing that kind of has me at the at the edge of my seat right now is I'm waiting for that eDNA mm-hmm. monitoring project to to wrap up and anxiously waiting the results from that, and then hoping to to continue that um, into next winter as well. Cool. And other than that, yeah, a few, not nothing's you know active, charismatic and exciting new in the field, but crunching through a bunch of data, collecting long-term data, um, collecting, trying to learn something new from data that we've already collected. Right. Right. Cool. And and we're waiting for permits too. We're always waiting for permits. (laughs) permits. But once among the permits that we're waiting on is, is the visual survey permit again for local creeks. And I will let you know when the time comes to to hop into water and look at some fish. That'd be awesome. I'm I'm ready to snorkel. This temperature's warmed up and I'm like, I went in in the water. Are you guys going back up to the reserve? I take it. That's the intention. Yes. Okay. Um, that, that defunct, uh, fish ladder you were talking about, is that a below or above, uh, the ecological reserve it's below it's in iron canyon it's the iron canyon okay. fish ladder okay i can send you some information on it that you can link to if you want yeah that'd be cool and also location because maybe some folks may want to hike up there and yeah. check it out yeah, i don't know no. how far above like bear hole is it it's probably a quarter mile half mile upstream oh. of salmon hole oh okay so it's a little ways up but yeah. a nice hike in the park yeah. or no. a bike ride no no better easily, time of year to do it and easily done in a day and you might even see some salmon so I was, like, I was see some salmon now. Yeah, I that's was right. just up there this last weekend, and if you go up there, long pants and lots of bug spray because ticks are out like oh, crazy. Is it ridiculous up there? It is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, cool. How long have you and, been saving that one up? Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know. That's probably not the first time I've, I've made that <laughs> that stupid pun. I'm sure, but um, I also saw a rattlesnake up there as well. Oh. They're out early. out already, huh? Yep, okay. Yep. Yep. But, um, you know, positioned by the toilet up there, good, the best spot for a rattlesnake. <laughs> it's like, oh, I can bite the most people here. But anyway, okay, well, with the ridiculous thing, we'll just probably wrap it up there. You guys, what do you think? Cool. Sounds sure. good to me. Until All right, well, time. thanks for coming on, you guys. How can people find you on the Instagrams and the Facebooks and the everything else? Um, right. If you look for Fish Bio, you, yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Oh, that was just your mic. Did I get any on you? No, 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 no. I muted, so barely. Anyway, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, in any case, no, if you if you want to find us, um, yeah. If, it's Fish Bio uh, at Instagram and then. At Fish uh, Bio. Fish, Jesus, at fish you bio. guys. And fishbio.com and all the Fish Bio. Good You're stuff. not marketers, I'll tell you that. <laughs> no. <laughs> a biologist. You didn't get hired bio- for that, right? We're fish nerds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you know your website? Fishbio.com. All right. Yeah. Ding ding. Um, what other? So your what about Facebook? I don't know your Facebook. I'm off Facebook, so I don't, yeah, that's a good I've call. never had a Facebook. So. That's a good call. So I'm not on that. I, but um, I, I got a Flickr. Fish, hate. If you look Fish Bio oh. on Flickr for lots of good photos, um, including some cool. trying to move up Big Chico Creek. Yeah, um, I want to. Um, that artificial. Have you guys seen the artificial? Uh, artificial. Uh, what's it? Documentary that Patagonia has put out. Um, we just talked about it, it this morning. I they're wish doing there was a screening closer they're, by. Yeah, the closest ones, sac- or, uh, I think San Francisco. And I was yeah, like, oh, I can't make too it. too far. But once that, once that uh, gets on Netflix or however they're going to put it out online, 
I would like to watch it with you guys maybe and then maybe just do an episode around, you know, what your thoughts yeah. are. No, I'd love to watch because that. Because is it overreach? Are they do you guys feel like they're overreaching? I don't know. I obviously haven't seen it, but Can we can we try to pull some strings and get a local screening? I I'd, I'd be up for that. That'd be good. That would be cool. Um talk, why don't you talk to Doug see if he can sponsor it because well, there would I don't be, know how much we need. We yeah, need I mean there's out. there's two places we could well, there's three places we could show it in town. Delray, Pageant, Big and, Room. And the little one. Oh, yeah, there's four then. Big Room would be killer. Big Room would be killer. And I think that Big might. Big Room, yeah. they would be, that's it a would great fit, call. It would okay. fit with, I'll work I think, on that. the, yeah. Yeah, and then with, maybe, oh, now a plan's coming together. So maybe <laughs> we do the screening here, and we're, we're we're like lamenting about these signs, right? What if we got did like a you know ten bucks twenty bucks it had to come in and all those all that money goes to maybe putting some signs on, say Butte Creek or or, or, or Big Chico. There we do, go. Donate to a fish ladder or something like that. Something. Too. Yeah. Something. We need, we need a very 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 know. big room to make the fish ladder yeah. happen. Yeah. But I think we can the make signs, some signs so happen. Signs are good. If, if there's anybody still listening, um, <laughs> and you guys and you guys like that idea, let us know um, when we publish this episode um, and and put it in Instagram. I'd like to know what you guys think. Um, what else? I think I'm good. Uh, if, if like always, if you guys like this episode, please rate us on um, iTunes, and you know we're we're available on Google Play, Android, uh, everywhere. Alexa, really, we have an Alexa app. It's crazy. And and others, thanks for listening, you guys. I'll let you get back to your driving or you're about to go to bed or wherever you're, what you're doing right now. But thanks for listening. We appreciate it. All right. Well, mm-hmm. thanks for having us. Yep. Yep. This podcast would not be possible without support from our sponsors, Fish Bio and Amped Up Bill. Fish Bio is a consulting firm that offers a fresh approach to fishery science. They specialize in fish research, monitoring, and conservation with innovative uses of technology and communication. From their offices in Chico, Oakdale, and Santa Cruz, California, to Vienchen, Laos, Fish Bio is committed to solving natural resource challenges locally and globally. Learn more at www.fishbio.com. And Amp.Bill. Amp is a software design and engineering shop located in Chico, California. Amp creates beautiful apps for mobile and desktop devices, wearables, and the Internet of Things. Amp develops native, web, and hybrid apps on a variety of platforms. Chad, who co-hosts this podcast, is the agency's founder. Learn more at www.amp.bill.